Are we good? We should be good. All right, guys. Uh, so you can see this the slideshow, okay? That's up on the screen. Yeah, so that looks what, great. Fire is a native landscape. It is not an oxymoron. Okay. Well, here we go. All right. So just a little about myself. Um, I kind of came to this field, this profession uh, from uh, a bit of a different background. I used to be an aerospace engineer, which uh, I had a successful career for nine years, but uh, native plants were my passion. And 27 years ago, I uh, actually uh, uh, made the very logical transition from aerospace engineer to California native landscape contractor. And uh, it's been wonderful. I don't regret it at all. And um, we've been involved in over 750 native landscapes in Southern California. Uh, we did the infield at the Del Mar Thoroughbred Racetrack. You might know of the where the turf meets the surf, and now it's where the natives meet the surf. Uh, we did the Lux Art Institute, uh, and uh, we did a very large complex sanderling at Aviar. Uh, in Carlsbad, which is a community in North San Diego County. And uh, I co-authored with Lucy Warren a couple of books that uh, are still selling like gangbusters. Uh, the first one was The California Native Landscape uh, in 2013, which is more of a textbook and really goes into the hows and whys of the horticulture of adapting California native ecology to your yard. And then the second book in 2016, The Drop Defined California Garden, which touches on horticulture, but it's mostly a plant encyclopedia. So we've got those out there. All right, so background. Um, yeah, most of the plants that we use in our California native landscapes, they come from our Mediterranean plant communities. Okay, and when I say Mediterranean, I mean basically from the mountains west. Now we do do desert landscapes. But on a whole, we're concentrating on these coastal communities, which have a very unique and very rare ecology, the Mediterranean climate zone. And, you know, some of the name uh, plant communities in that include chaparral and coastal sage scrub and oak woodland. Okay. And the thing is that these communities are under threat. Uh, you know, basic land abuse, I mean, you might be thinking that you're looking at oak savanna, okay? But actually what you're looking at is cow pasture with some oak trees in it. Everything else has been removed because it's not viable for agriculture. And that's what most of the California is turning into very rapidly. And of course, uh, fuel reduction is a real threat, especially with all this, um, these carbon credit funds to spend. So they do things like go in the middle of nowhere and do a quote unquote fuel break, which wiped out a huge stand here of Refugio Manzanita, which is rare enough. But of course, uh, as CNPS people, we know when you do something like this to a, a clean, a stable native plant community, you basically turn it into this. And when you turn it into this, um, you have destroyed the ecology. There is nothing left. There's no habitat, there's no moisture. This is desertification. And boy, is this stuff ready to burn. Uh, these flashy fields, these non-native grasses and mustards and weeds uh, will burn every August if you give it the opportunity. So it's a real giant step backwards. Um, I mean, to look at this here with too frequent fire, well, to call this the Coles Levy Ecosystem Preserve is uh, kind of ironic because there is no ecosystem being preserved here, in fact, if you look in the upper left, you'll see that the erosion is so bad, it's left rills in there. There's nothing left in the, of this habitat. And that's from way too frequent fire. 
in fact, if you want to eliminate a good stand of chaparral, just burn it a couple of times in 10 years, it'll be gone. Um, it can definitely be eliminated by the wrong kind of fire. It's not made to burn, okay? This is a huge misnomer that chaparral, coastal sage scrub has to burn instead in, in order to remain healthy. That is completely inaccurate. And in fact, fire suppression is what saved what's left of most of our Mediterranean plant communities. Okay, there's no, there's, you know, how, how well do you suppress these fires anyway? And they're all arson anyway. So they're not made to burn. Chaparral is made to burn like your house is made to burn because you have fire insurance. That's kind of the analogy I can throw out there. And here's a great example, sort of the serendipitous photo that shows what higher fire, fire frequency can do to healthy ecosystems. On the far upper left, uh, that chaparral community burned 1970. The photo was taken about, I think, 2008, maybe. Uh, in the middle, this burned again in 2001. You can already see it starting to degrade. And then the one on the lower right burned again in 2003. And again, we're right back to basically weedy cow pasture. We, this is the biggest threat, in fact, we have to our native plant communities, even worse than uh, development, is just all these super frequent fires. And basically, you take something that started as this and you turn it into this, okay? And it's happening all over the place. You know, and, and being the dense, impenetrable, and prone to huge, intense fires, that's the natural condition of chaparral, okay? It's not the fault of conservationists. It's not the fault of past fire suppression policy, okay? That is just what chaparral does, okay? But it's all about fire frequency, okay? So prior to human habitation, I'm talking long before indigenous people showed up, you know, this, this ecosystem has developed over millions of years, long before humans were even a species, okay? And without that human constant, um, uh, fire source, the, the actual natural burn frequency was more on the order of about every 30 to 130 years, okay? And that is what chaparral has uh, evolved and adapted to. Very infrequent, but catastrophic fires, but then a period of recovery and ecological succession following that before it's really ready to burn again. If you go any higher than that, well, then you lose the ecosystem. That's just a fact. So what are our ignition sources? Well, you take humans out of the equation. What, what natural ignition sources are there out there? Well, lightning. Um, did anybody say lightning? How about lightning? Um, wait, I got another one. Volcanoes, OK? And how often do you have lightning storms during what we call Santa Ana wind events? You guys are seeing that now, these offshore winds uh, as uh, kind of like a, a Diablo winds, but it's kind of the same sort of phenomenon. And you don't often see a lightning storm and these wind events. And so it would be a, a pretty rare confluence of uh, factors that would actually ignite a fire with a lightning storm and then keep it lit, let it dwell until uh, these offshore winds pick up and fall. And, uh, and that's when you, you're off to the races basically. So that was a pretty rare phenomenon uh, before humans showed up. And so, Everybody likes to bring up indigenous burning, right? Well, that had nothing to do with the natural evolution of chaparral. Uh, I mean, how long have indigenous folks been here? Well, maybe 15,000 years versus several million. Okay, so that's when this stuff evolved. 
So the vast majority of fires are human caused. And actually, uh, Dr. John Keeley and Alex Seifert did a study of all Southern California counties and per county discovered that 97 to 100% were human caused from 1919 to 2016. Just about a hundred year period there, 97 to 100% of all fires in Southern California uh, counties were started by human activity. Uh, so what are some common uh, ignition sources? Well, arson, you've got uh, too many sick people running around uh, lighting fires. And uh, certainly electrical fire from power lines arcing. Uh, after our fires down here in San Diego in 2003, 2007, our massive fire events, uh, our power company, sdg and &E, went out and started clearing about 10 foot radius around all power poles. And that has really helped. That, is, that has actually been uh, very effective. Um, believe it or not, smoking can still be a, a factor, although hopefully that's starting to decrease. Um, this is huge, guys. Sparking landscape equipment. In the last month, I know of at least four fires in San Diego County that have started this way. This picture, in fact, and ironically, it's usually during fire remediation activity. Uh, this picture was taken less than a mile from where I'm sitting right now, in my office, uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago. And it was basically someone out there with a flail mower mowing down the grass and they hit a rock and the spark and boom. And it was kind of serendipitous to get the picture of the actual lawnmower that started this and the flames. And the point of this is, you know, if you're out there and it's dormant season, you know, all these non-native flashy fuels are dead or dying, has some kind of moisture source readily available. So a few five gallon buckets of water, if not a hose bib, um, just something to put out the flames immediately if you spark something, okay? This is a huge cause of fires uh, during the summer months. People burning trash. Uh, the Pumashaw fire in Mount Palomar was started by someone who decided to burn his trash in the middle of the Santa Ana wind of it, burn down half the mountain. Uh, this one's pretty common. Uh, bad catalytic converters on cars. They start, you've probably been behind one that's spitting out its guts and you know, maybe every quarter mile you see this chunk of flaming whatever coming out of their exhaust. Well, if they're in the right lane and it happens to catch the, uh, the flashy fuel there, boom. And you, you, you can tell as you'll be driving along, it'll be these little fires evenly spaced about every quarter mile. And uh, you think maybe it's an arsonist, but it's actually somebody driving along that's got a bad catalytic converter or they're pulling a trailer and it's dragging a chain and sparking, or they've lost a tire on the trailer, you know, it can be any of that stuff. And believe it or not, children playing with fire is still an issue. In 2014, uh, a 14-year-old girl was running around lighting fires and lit up half of North County. So how do we deal with this? Well, most strategies, they encompass a zonal approach. And that's within the first 100 feet of a home, sometimes 150 feet, sometimes more than that. But generally it's 100 feet out from the home. And the zones are, this is a new one, zone zero, which is usually out to about five feet from the, from the house itself, out of the apron about five feet out. Then zone one or zone A, depending on the fire district, is usually the next 30 to 50 feet. And then zone two or zone B is usually the next 50 to 70 feet or more, okay? So I'll go through each of these zones here and uh, tell you what we do in each of them. So zone zero is interesting because uh, it's newly designated and basically uh, we create an apron of inorganic 
material, either dirt, DG, gravel, concrete, whatever, right up against the house. And this is to keep flames from licking up underneath the eaves. It's really important. Um, and so we don't typically do plantings in this area. I mean, I've had, and you'll see even see pictures in a little bit, where I've had plantings underneath the eaves with no problem, but they were small, they were low uh, fuel volume. Uh, and they're actually re-examining this and say, do you have to have just zero plantings in that first zone or can you have some small plants in there or succulents or something? So they're evaluating that currently. But in general, we like to keep an apron. I mean, this concrete apron helped save this house, all right? This was in the 2007 Witch Creek fire and it was a hot fire, okay? I mean, that grass, the lawn actually burned. All right. And if you look on the hillside and back there, uh, you'll see a streak of metal. That was a metal water tank. And all the neighbors surrounding our client's property burned to the ground, unfortunately. This is actually one of our earliest apron experiments. This is back, we did this about 2002, right before the cedar fire. The cedar fire came through, the property came through with flying colors, was later used as part of our study. Uh, I think nowadays I wouldn't even bother trying to, to mulch the plants kind of just outside of the apron. I think I just run that gravel or DG right out to the pathway there. But so be it. It, it, it survived the fire just fine, very defensible. Uh, this is an installation we just completed a couple months ago out in East County. It's completely surrounded by incredible chaparral. I mean, they've got Ceanothus cyaneus and Bahiopsis growing on their slopes naturally surrounding the house. And this is an example of that five foot apron. It's not unattractive, but boy, does it make a difference in creating defensible space. And uh, you don't have any, it keeps the vegetation from, you know, contacting the house and burning underneath the eaves. Okay, now after zone zero, we have zone one or A. And basically zone one and zone zero are the most critical to, def to creating defensible space. You know, firefighters will go through neighborhoods and they'll look at your property and they will actually make these decisions. Basically, I can defend that house, I cannot defend that house. And what goes on in these first two zones is critical to that thinking because firefighters are incredibly um, skillful and courageous, but they don't necessarily want to give their lives trying to save someone's possessions, okay? So it's a very conscious decision that they make. And in that first 30 to 50 feet, often we have a lot of hardscape. Uh, in this case, this house, the fire came through here and it was untouched. Um, uh, we had uh, sort of a Southwestern style landscape that was well spaced with gravel mulch because that's what desert plants really prefer, but also helps with fire. And of course the structure itself is kind of a Santa Fe uh, Pueblo and uh, there's very little externally that will actually burn. So this did just fine. Um, often what's going on in these this first zone is spot fires ahead of the fire front, okay? It's not usually a massive wall of flame that just comes through and scours and burns everything down. Often it's actually flying embers or very sadly, something they don't talk about, burning animals, all right? You know, it's pretty upsetting. This is what happens when we lose all this habitat because, we, you know, we're letting fires burn, for instance, because we think it's good for the ecology. Well, no, you destroy the habitat and it's pretty upsetting to see, you know, squirrels or rabbits running, you know, on fire and uh, ending up going underneath that pile of logs you've piled up against the house in the backyard. So, uh, yeah, that's just the reality. Also, guys, Fences, fences burn like hell, okay? They burn hot and they burn high. And I'm not so worried about the wood fence in general, but it's actually where uh, it comes in and contacts your house on the side of the house, say by the garage, 
Okay. That little pony wall there, that little stub, if it's wood, it just, you know, wood gate, wood fence, it just wicks the fire right in underneath the eaves into your rafters and your garage and where there's lots of airspace and boom, you're off to the races. Okay. Much better if you handle that with stucco walls or maybe metal gates. Okay. Inflammable uh, walls and gates can really help protect your home. And these fires as that fire gets wicked in along that wooden fence and these are really hot fires and also don't pile wood firewood and debris against your house don't mount a wooden shed against your house underneath your eaves okay um you know you want to walk around the house and do this mental exercise of you've got a box of matches and you're you know click 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 you're just you're just you know uh burning these matches and flicking them off and what's it going to catch on fire okay you're like a human ember at that point so uh that's kind of a good mental exercise to do Great. also in zone 1a we typically uh have permanently irrigated plantings all right and in this case instead of a lawn we're actually using a native field sedge called carex pregracillus makes a, a beautiful uh, meadowy lawn or you can even mow it too and it just it even smells like cut grass after you mow it it's quite tough you can run animals on it or people and uh, you water it about half as much as a conventional lawn. Hey Greg we have a couple of relevant questions for right now sure. I had said to bring up um, we have one asking for clarification um, wood fences not a good idea 30 to 50 feet from the house I'm not real worried about it. I mean, um, in fire zones, uh, they're going to burn. But unless you do masonry walls, which are, you know, incredibly uh, expensive, uh, there isn't much that isn't going to either burn or melt. You know, these plastic fences they have, these PVC fences, they just melt. They just melt and turn into, they just, just sag over and bleh. So... Well, the key is where it contacts the house, where it makes that right turn. And you've got a gate there. Uh, you have that section of wood fence and maybe a wooden gate. That is a huge problem. And that's how that fire can just wick right into um, the rafters, right into your garage, right into your eaves. And uh, so that at least that portion there should be like masonry and a uh, either really thick timber gate that, that it, you know, would take a lot to ignite or metal or something like that. Okay, great, thanks. And how about um, if somebody has a redwood care, um, de tracks deck around their place, is zone zero outside of the deck or including under the deck? So, yeah, that one's a little tricky. So typically it would actually be the deck would start after zone zero. Uh, the truth is though, there's a lot of decking material now that Trex makes, Timber Tech makes, that's actually considered fire resistant. The old stuff burns like crazy, but the new stuff is pretty fire resistant. The real key on that is the header board, or the outside board should be something like hardy board, like a concrete board. And also you don't want the fire getting up underneath the deck so uh, creating some kind of uh, fire resistant paneling there to keep the anything and, and not piling up, not using it as a source storage space underneath with flammable stuff that will burn and the fire gets underneath there because that is a real dangerous situation. All right. Well, one more and then we'll let you go on and we'll keep collecting sure. questions. No, Carex what? <laughs> what was the name of the grass? Carex what? Carex pregracillus. Easy one to spell, right? Uh, actually, let me let me uh, let me go backwards here. You can just see it. There it is. You know that that lawn, that meadowy lawn there, that was taken in La Jolla, and La Jolla is a real high end community here in San Diego. And I expected to go back and take a picture of this beautifully manicured lawn of Carrick's, and instead. They like the look of it so much. And I got to admit, I think it's kind of pretty myself. 
that they decide not to cut it. They just like the way it came in and they still can play in it and stuff. And so it's really good. You know, there's Carex Ponds. Uh, uh, Pregacillus is native actually even here in San Diego and it just does a wonderful job. You just gotta keep the weeds out of it uh, when you plant and usually we get plugs and plug it in about every eight to 12 inches. Great. Well, thanks for the for answering those. We'll keep collecting answer or questions and answering the ones we can. Sorry, everyone, Great. about the chat again. Yeah, I, I love questions. You know, especially if they're really, really pertinent. So I don't, I don't want you to get lost or sitting there mulling the question over, and I'm going off the whole presentation. Anyway, uh, so now we're at zone two or zone B. Uh, it usually starts at that 30 to 50 foot line. And it can extend out 100 feet from the house, 150 feet, or even more from the house. Um, there's a couple of different scenarios in that zone, all right? Either you've got existing natives growing there, all right? And that needs to be modified to lend it some fire resistance. Or if it's just weeds, it's not a bad idea to go in there and do a new native planting with some light irrigation. Okay, so there's a couple different scenarios here. So if we're looking at managing existing native vegetation, uh, site hygiene is critical, okay? Controlling your weeds. In this case, controlling the weeds had the added benefit of bringing these rare and endangered Engelman oaks, all 40 of them on this 10 acre property, not only back to life, but into bright yellow bloom. They were the only Engelman oaks in this whole valley that actually went into flower. And that's one of the reasons they're so rare is they're not reproducing. And one of the reasons they don't reproduce is they're choked off with weeds and they are not happy, not happy at all. This is actually how that site looked when we started, okay? It was a mess of non-native oak grass and fillery and mustard. And so in this managing your native vegetation, this is the first thing that you go in and target is get rid of these non-native flashy fuels, okay? I mean, the only thing native in this photo are those oak trees in this background, the middle upper right. Um, here's an example of a site that was, that was they practiced good site hygiene. This is actually a, a pretty rare mission manzanita. And you wouldn't even realize that the cedar fire had come through here, except uh, for that burned out dead wood knot. The rest of the plant was healthy and hydrated and happy, and it looked perfect. It did not, it wasn't singed, nothing. And that's because the flame height was only a few inches because they'd gotten rid of all the weeds and all that smoldered was the mulch, okay? And, a much lower intensity fire coming through there. And the, and the all, you know, because this client did this, the, the whole native plant community surrounding the house survived and, uh, you know, was, was very fire resistant. Here's an important concept. This is about dealing with uh, curtailing fire ladders, all right? And the concept here is that you want to prune your large shrubs and trees up about three times whatever the height of the understory is. So in this case, if your buckwheats and say are, are 18 inches high, you wanna have a gap of three times that, which is four and a half feet. So that means that the bottom branches start at about six feet. I hope that makes sense. So you want that interval in there to keep the flames from laddering up from that lower understory vegetation into the crown of the trees. Very effective. Or maybe you have thick, dense chaparral, coastal sage scrub, if you're lucky, growing in this zone too. And normal uh, prescriptions are to thin it to about 50 to 60% coverage. So you remove 40 to 50% of the uh, vegetation or, or trim it back and open it up. So basically you start with something like this and you end up with something more or less like this, okay? And by doing that, you actually remove about 70% of the fuel volume, all right? 
but also those branches and limbs make the most fantastic mulch. Uh, when we do this work, we have a mulcher on site and we put that mulch right back down on the ground because unfortunately, when you open these plant communities up, they lose a lot of their weed resistance. And that's the problem. It wants to come back in non-native flashy fuels, weeds, that act as fire ladders that compromise the hydration and health of the native plant community. And uh, that's actually a worse situation to see if you've got a mix of weeds and really unhealthy native plants. You want to control those weeds and putting that beautiful, wonderful mulch back down really can help with that. It also helps retain moisture. And you can even take it to the next level. Um, you know, most people bulldoze this stuff, all right? What they end up with is cow pasture and erosion and just a terrible fire hazard. But instead, what you can do is come in here and basically carve out a mature native landscape from once impenetrable chaparral. I mean, if you think it's $100,000 an acre to $200,000 an acre to do a native landscape installation, and yet you have all this beautiful chaparral and oak woodland on your property, just go in there and thin it out, clean it up, put paths through it. You can put bird baths and benches and sitting areas and bridges, plant perennials along the edges of the paths. And it's a wonder, okay? And you have not destroyed the habitat, okay? And it's beautiful and it's low maintenance and it's natural. So, you know, a word to the wise. Here's an example. This is one of the properties that was in our, our test sample in our study, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's roughly 50% thinning. That's what a manzanita forest looks like after it's been thinned about 50%. Actually, Cal Fire came out here. They saw this, they loved it, okay? And the, the limbs, the, they removed the dead limbs. They just uh, thinned it out. Maybe some of the chemise and the buckwheat you kind of cut to the ground but we don't rip them out we don't want that disturbance we want to keep the roots in there and the new green vegetation that comes up is much better hydrated than the old woody half dead growth and so you just trim those back to the ground and then you put your mulch down and it's beautiful it's like your own private native park all right this is what it looks like so one of the things that we're actually you know, in landscaped areas. So let's say we didn't have that beautiful manzanita forest. Instead, it's trashed, you know, it's an open field. It's just nothing but weeds. And you need to landscape it. You need to, to do something both for, for aesthetics and to, you know, create a landscape. And you really advisable for a lot of reasons to use native plants. We almost always put light permanent irrigation in those areas. This is so important. And by light irrigation, I'm talking, we're watering about 0.2 to a quarter inch of equivalent rainfall two or three times a month in summer from about, well, let's say end of May to maybe middle of October, just whatever the warm season is. And we're giving this light irrigation to our planted native landscape because hydration is actually key. And we'll talk about that. It's not about plant list. I'm gonna disappoint you if you expect me to come and make a list of inflammable fireproof plants. They're not, anything can burn, anything can be hydrated, okay? It's all about hydration. And the corollary that it takes so little water to hydrate a native plant. So we love the MP rotators. There's a couple other products out there, but this is the most water efficient and the slowest application rate. It's just like a gentle rainstorm. So love the MPs. And uh, we're even experimenting with doing light hydration on wild existing uh, plant community like coastal sage scrub here. And just by doing this light supplemental irrigation, I mean, we're, we're, not, we're talking less than an inch of extra water a month. And heck, a thunderstorm can come through and dump an inch in an hour, all right? So it's well, well, well within the tolerance limits of these plants. And we're not getting overgrowth. You know, we're not killing these plants, but boy, are they hydrated and boy, does it look a lot better, okay? So 
it's really been quite successful. We're not seeing a, a real downside to coming in here and just putting some light irrigation in these natural areas uh, surrounding homes. And you're not penetrating deep in the soil. It's just like a, a refreshing rain, you know, summer thunderstorm or fog drip. And uh, really though, makes a big difference in the hydration levels. So, you know, when you're creating, building a, a native landscape in zone two, uh, in this case, we actually built a road all the way around this property. And at first the homeowner was horrified, but later grew to love their country lane. And by doing this, of course, we create a perimeter, we create access, we create a space that they can light backfires around the outside perimeter if need be, although the site hygiene is so good on this particular example that it's not even needed, all right? But within that, 75 to 100 foot perimeter, we have these lightly irrigated native ground covers and shrubs. Okay, in this case, backers, pigeon point, and uh, I don't know, I think we had some in Sealy or something. And uh, then with that zone one, we actually put a rock wall around there, and which acts like a little bit of a firewall. And then within that, we had a lot of flagstone. We had permanent irrigation to a lot of native and non-native stuff that can tolerate water. We had a couple of sycamore trees. And, uh, and then we had a really good apron or all the way around this house. We added about an eight foot wide decomposed granite apron all the way around. And again, it's the same kind of uh, zone zero concept, if you will. But notice again, the native landscape is lightly irrigated. It's well-spaced. It's healthy. And this house has actually been through, oh, four. Yeah, four, now four wildland fires. And the home is still standing beautifully, undamaged. Um, I want you to also notice the roofing on here, the metal clad roof on there really helps with um, ember attack and letting them kind of slide off there without getting purchased. So by the way, if you wanted to throw a little bit of planting on those posts, wild grape actually does maintain incredible hydration. I've got pictures of post-fire wild grape performance. So you can do that, but you gotta maintain it. You gotta, don't let it form a huge thicket and cut your dead wood out of there. But otherwise it's actually a pretty good vine. All right, so a lot of these properties were all, you know, we've had a couple dozen go in, go through fire events, major fire events. So the Navy, the U.S. Navy actually heard about our, our experience here and my, saw my slideshows and actually um, awarded us a research grant. And it was called the Ecologically Sustainable Fire Risk Reduction Project. And the problem was that most of the approaches out there are anecdotal right? It's just the way they've always done it. And it's not really based on true experimental design. And a lot of these approaches are incredibly destructive. And also you have inconsistent outcomes and it can even make the problems worse, okay? So I uh, uh, partnered up with Dr. John Keeley. Some of you may know that he is one of the world's leading fire ecologists. He's got hundreds upon hundreds of research papers out there dealing with fire ecology and behavior. And he was my co-principal investigator and he designed the actual experiments. And our goals were to develop science-based fuel management strategies, okay, that were ecologically sustainable, i.e. it supported natural habitat with lower water and maintenance requirement that were aesthetically pleasing year round. Okay, I'm talking year round. And then we collected our data points and we fed it into um, a very sophisticated modeling program called Fuel and Fire Tools. Uh, we used this sophisticated supercomputer based software because people are a little bit loath to have you lighting up their properties. Um, and the criteria for the experimental design was that the homes 
had to be located on the wildland urban interface. You guys are probably familiar with that term, WUI. All of them had to have survived a major fire event. And all of them had to include a lightly irrigated native landscape, natural chaparral or coastal sage scrub that was thinned according to common prescriptions, i.e. thinned by 40 to 50 percent, and also control areas on there of unmodified natural shrubland vegetation. So we had to have something to compare it against. And what we did was um, we set up uh, weather stations on all these sites. We set up soil moisture meters and we took samples of foliage from all three conditions of the same plants, whether it be buckwheats, uh, whether it be oaks, whether it be uh, laurel sumac, general chaparral. And we looked at the um, what's called the, uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm drawing the blank here. Uh, oh, live, sorry, live fuel moisture content, LFMC. And the way you check for moisture content is you take the leaves, you weigh them, you put them into a dryer, completely desiccate them and weigh them again. And so you can see what the percentage of the leaf was actually moisture, okay? And we fed that throughout the year into this computer program, along with all of the environmental factors from the weather stations and the moisture meters, okay? And we got these results that were significant. In fact, John said they far exceeded his expectations and which basically supported our approaches. And so what you're looking at is graphs here of a couple of different scenarios. Um, and the dotted line are the irrigated plantings, the dashed line are the thinned plantings, and then the solid line are the control, the unmodified control. And in every case, the irrigated vegetation had lower rates of fire spread, whether it was, you know, regardless of whether the, what, of what the slope percentage was, okay? So that relationship was always, um, the best was the irrigated followed by the thin, often closely followed by the thin vegetation. And both are substantially better than the unmodified controls, okay? So that relationship existed no matter what the slope was, no matter what the wind speed was, you always had that, that relative fire resistance. So this was significant and it was consistent. So it really showed the efficacy and, you know, nobody's even tested like thinning to see what the effect of thinning. And basically when you thin this stuff out, the idea is that there's less draw on uh, stored groundwater, okay? And so each plant, individual plant has more available naturally. And then of course, with the planted and lightly irrigated, you have a source of moisture uh, throughout the summer, but it's on a level of thunderstorms, okay? And that's probably, this is, this I'm sure contributed to why we have never, knock wood, lost a house in a fire event. So the bottom line was the rate of fire spread was lowest for irrigated native plantings followed by thin planting as opposed to untreated control vegetation. And that was apparent regardless of slope angle and wind speed. And then a couple of conclusions can be that native plants maintain much higher live fuel moisture content than traditional plants on less water. So it's all about hydration. It's all about live fuel moisture content. And then if you're using predominantly evergreen natives, so we use about 75% evergreens, and that is because we want this thing to look good and have backbone throughout the year. Uh, they exhibited even higher levels of live fuel moisture content, as opposed to say a summer dormant plant that is in dormancy and somewhat desiccated. And then if you go into lower profiles, you have even better fire behavior 
along with all the other benefits of doing native landscapes. And by the way, in case you're wondering why the Navy of all people is incredibly interested in this stuff. I mean, yes, they are out in the middle of the ocean usually, but it turns out that they administer hundreds of thousands of acres of naval housing, most of which are located on their reservations uh, right, right up against the wildlands. And so when somebody comes along and says, uh, yeah, you can have something that looks beautiful throughout the years, great erosion control, is wonderful habitat. They're really interested in that. Um, it's easy to maintain, uses less water, and oh, by the way, it's fire resistant. That definitely got their attention. Okay, so we'll talk a little about plant selection here. And as I mentioned, hydration always takes precedence over plant lists, all right? And, you know, we did years ago after the cedar fire, we just did this very unscientific little test here. We'd gotten about, this is in fall, and we'd gotten about a quarter inch of rainfall the week before. So that's similar to what we would be watering. And we said, let's just go ahead and grab some different chaparral plants and try to burn them. And lo and behold, we couldn't get anything to ignite. Not the ceanothus, not the sugar bush, not even the sage. Uh, we, out of frustration, we just piled everything together. We couldn't even get that to hold flame, okay? But you add flashy fuels, non-native, dead, dormant weeds to the mix, and boom, ignition. And that can act as your fire ladder. And by the way, when you see them lighting backfires with their oil cans, they're not trying to light chaparral. Chaparral is typically very difficult to light initially. They're lighting the grass and the weeds, okay, and letting it wick up into the chaparral. So, and natives just require much less water to achieve that level of hydration than non-native plants do. So, you know, as far as your basic groups or types of plantings, you know, for fire resistant slopes, well, nothing at all is typically a bad option <laughs> for a lot of reasons. People love to use ice plant even to this day. Uh, maybe drought tolerant non-natives and succulents, not bad. Or you can choose natives. All of them have their advantages and disadvantages. Well, ice plant, certainly it's cheap and it's readily available. Uh, Quick fill, um, it's green. Uh, disadvantages are that it's really crappy erosion control. Uh, some of you might have heard of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Well, that's what actually helps really stabilize slopes is the partner to the root systems of natives. Well, this stuff is pretty much non-mycorrhizal and it's heavy. And I've seen plenty of slopes pulled down by a covering of ice plants maybe ripples of ice plant at the bottom of the slope on the dirt that fell off. Um, it actually needs a fair amount of water to stay green and hydrated. And it can be very invasive and it can form, the real problem with this stuff is that underneath it'll form these thatches and boy do those thatches burn. And when they burn, the, the ice plant above it just vaporizes the moisture volatilizes off and then what's left behind just burns and it burns great. Hey, yeah, it's boring to downright ugly. So, you know, I guess I the beholder on that one. So what's the next step up? Well, certainly drought tolerant non-natives and succulents can create beautiful landscapes. And often they have ironically better availability than many natives, all right? I once wrote an article for California Garden Magazine, it says, why should something native be so exotic? Um, there's lots of beautiful plants to choose from. It can be very colorful. Some of the disadvantages, they need about twice the water of a typical native planting to achieve the same level of fire resistant hydration. Didn't show this experimentally, but this is just over 30 years here of working with both. And I actually have pictures here, some relative comparisons. And it works out to about twice the water that a native uh, planting would, would require to, to achieve fire resistance. Uh, certainly they're much better slope stabilizers than ice plant, but not nearly as good as natives. Uh, they're 
often higher maintenance than natives because you have to do more deadheading with these things, okay? They have lots and lots and lots of flowers and they can look pretty rough and can be a little bit more flammable if they carry all these dead uh, flower stalks over these plants. So you need to kind of get in there and kind of clean them up. And they don't have quite the wildlife. They do have wildlife value, but not as significant as the plants that our wildlife actually evolved with, okay, natives. And then, you know, natives definitely have a lot of advantages. They work beautifully in all of our properties, again, knock wood. Uh, much less water is required to achieve that level of fire resistance. Um, the soil biology, that mycorrhizal fungi is naturally soil stabilizing. And it also stores water, guys, too. So it's actually a water source in the summer months. Uh, the evergreen natives, virtually no maintenance. Your Cianothus, your Manzanitas, your Toyons, your Lemonade Berry, et cetera. Uh, we don't use fertilizer or soil amendments with natives. In fact, that's one of the worst things you can do because you really screw up their ecology. Uh, the best bird and butterfly habitat. And, you know, they lend a sense of regional identity. Down here in Southern California, we're forgetting what it used to look like. We're so busy turning it into South Florida. They're naturally weed resistant. A lot of people don't realize that. When you hit about 70% canopy coverage with natives, a natural weed inhibition on a grand scale actually starts to kick in. And some of the disadvantages, there's not as many suppliers out there. That's starting to change. We're trying to change it, aren't we folks? And uh, they really don't like ornamental horticulture and they're not super fond of drip irrigation. And especially in these fire slopes, we recommend overhead irrigation. Rainfall basically is what it is. Uh, you know, sometimes you can't avoid inline netafin drip like in narrow planters and stuff. But we just seem to do so much better and it's so much easier if we just give them overhead watering with those MP rotators. Oh, and the mulch up north there, they're really freaking out about the mulch. Um, that's really sad. So all we use down here, all we've used for 25 years is shredded redwood bark. All these landscapes that survived fires were mulched in shredded redwood bark. Um, it is the closest, best analogous material to a natural duff layer that forms in these plant communities. Chaparral, cold sage scrub, they form their own mulch over time. But when you're putting in a, a new installation, your chicken and egg phenomenon, you got to break in there and you got to use some kind of a mulch to get it started. Shredded redwood by far is the best. And the key is, and what everybody, everybody's missing in this, is consolidation. So the fact that we water overhead automatically hydrates and consolidates consolidates the mulch and it goes from about three to four inches thick down to less than an inch. Okay. And at that point, it is a poorly oxygenated fuel. If it's all fluffed up, heck, anything will burn, including steel wool. We used to burn that as kids. Okay. But you get it consolidated down and packed. Not only do the plants love it, not only does the ecology love it, but the, it tends to burn with about a two inch flame height. And I've got pictures to show you of that, of course. People ask about oak leaf litter. Do we leave the oak leaves in place? Yes, you do, okay? You know, you could probably, you know, remove the top inch or two. And yes, it will burn maybe 12 to 18 inches. But in general, if you have this, oak leaf litter in place, you've got a well hydrated oak tree that is healthy, that isn't a bunch of twigs, that isn't falling apart, isn't dying in places, that has no weeds growing under it that not only compromise the health of the tree, but also act as ladder fuels, okay? And oak trees have so much moisture in them, not only have I seen them save houses, but unfortunately when you have weeds under them and it's, and it's unhealthy and it's allowed to burn, they actually end up exploding. You get steam in the middle of these things and boom, right out the top. So uh, leave your oak leaf litter in place, unless you're within a 
five feet of the house. And then it's not a bad idea to do your apron underneath the eaves, okay? But other than that, in general, we recommend leaving the oak leaf litter. And we also recommend putting in some hydrated native plants that are companion plants that are understory that help provide carbohydrates through that mycorrhizal fungal plant system to the oak tree. And then the oak tree is acting as the hydraulic pump for the rest of the plant community and providing moisture again through that mycorrhizal fungi. So this is stuff that's all been ignored by horticulture folks, okay? And it's so important to understanding successful native landscapes, okay? Well, Greg, we're right at about 6.30 and I'm not sure how much you have left, but I wanna make sure we don't run too far over and we're respectful of your time here. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, we're getting towards the uh, final part. Um, and this is what that same plant you know, the mulch look like about 14 months later. And everybody wants to know what the plants are. So that's what the plants are. Yeah, I wrote them down. So um, anyway, the beautiful planting, this plant, this community loved their, their native landscape. It was about three acres of the common area. And the oak trees that were deeded with the property that could not be removed sprung into life as soon as we started putting natives around got rid of all the honeysuckle and crud okay so this is the end of the end run here for this thing and i think something that's kind of fun to show everybody and that's the final case histories here this is the actual pictures and descriptions of properties that we burned that we burned that got burned and uh we didn't lose a single structure and you don't want to end up like this guy right here in Poway and uh, look at his shake shingle roof. I think maybe actually this was Poway Scripps area. I think he actually survived though, that's good. But you don't want to be in this position. So we've, by our reckoning, had more fire involved native landscapes than any other contractor in the state. Uh, we had one in the Pumasha, two in the Pines Fimer in Julian, the huge cedar fire, we had seven. Uh, Witch Creek, we had six. Harris Fire, we had two. Hidden Meadows Fire, we had one. And then we also had a fire marshal for the city of Encinitas run actual burn tests on the gorilla hair, on the shredded redwood bark, while we were doing the Lux Art Institute installation. Cedar Fire, there's the dreaded, horrible gorilla hair mulch. Well, I want you to notice these little orange things. Those are plastic marker flags. And the significance of those is that they were put in before the fire. And although I would no longer run mulch right up to the house back in 2003, uh, it was actually rather serendipitous because if you look on the screen line, you can actually see what the flame height was. And it was two inches or less. And you can see that these plastic marker flags didn't even melt. Well, the one in the foreground melted a little. That wasn't due to the mulch. That was due to the burning garden hose. All right. But you can see a lot of the mulch actually is unburned in places. All right. It's very densified and very poorly oxygenated. It, in fact, it didn't even, you see that next to the hose? That is a drain grate. Okay. That didn't even melt. All right, so this gives you an idea of how this redwood mulch, when it's consolidated, performs and honest to goodness fires. Here's the backyard. Uh, again, unburnt plastic marker flags all over the place, unburnt areas of mulch. This was the middle of the cedar fire, guys, came right through here. Doesn't mean the house wasn't almost lost because about two weeks before the fire, on this corner here, the homeowner had a quart of firewood stacked. And fortunately, the wife won the argument and got him to move it away from the house. So he put it over by the propane tank. Uh, however, the house almost burned, not because of the tile roof or the vents that are screened or the double pane windows with metal frames, very important, but because of the wicker furniture at the back door. And that burned with about a seven foot height. And the firefighters who were summoned by a, a neighbor who resisted the evacuation order came in, broke through, broke into the house, broke out the drywall on the other side and saved the house. And that is the look from the house out the back. And they were, yes, in the middle of the cedar fire. 
Uh, I was talking about that wild grape. Well, look at that. You wouldn't even know there's a fire here except for that incinerated ficus benjamina by the garage door. Look at the overhead though. Uh, no wood in that. That is masonry and steel. Very important. If you're going to do overhead structure, do non-flammable. And this is really important from that relative flammability standpoint because the black smudge was ground cover rosemary being watered about once every two weeks. Clearly that wasn't enough hydration to keep this from melting down, but the buckwheat that blew in on the wind not only survived, it was still covered in green leaves, okay? So again, with two weeks hydration, that was enough to provide fire resistance, but not for the non-native rosemary. If it had been watered by our experience about once every week, it would have fared much better. Same thing here, again, don't plant right up to the house here. Uh, this is back in the old days, but look, because they were hydrated, we pretty much singed. We didn't even uh, singe the paint on the house, okay? So that hydration was making all the difference. Here's that photo again, very, very hot fire. Okay, like I said, that melted water tank on the slope there. Uh, this is another one in rangeland. You asked about decks. Well, I didn't build this deck here, uh, but again, we didn't generate enough flame height, radiant heat to burn this wooden deck at the back of the house and the house was saved. Okay, and you can see the irrigation. There's a overhead irrigation rotary right there. And here's how it looked three years later to show you that that whole landscape was singed, not killed, and it came back beautifully. Again, here, homes that cleared for hundreds of feet and they weren't, solid, they, they weren't saved. And the importance in that, and this is drawing my old aerospace experience, was when you cleared a bare ground, like a lot of insurance companies want you to do, and you create absolute environmental devastation, and you still end up with a home that's a pile of ash with some green queen palms around it. What I realized almost immediately was that if you clear everything around, what you've done is you've created the perfect bowling alley for embers. Nothing to create turbulence, nothing to break up those 80 mile an hour winds with zero humidity and full of embers like the firefalls of Yosemite going sideways. Yeah, you create, you, from an aerospace standpoint, you create laminar flow. Same thing here, just blew through here. It was all cleared, all destroyed, and it didn't help the homes. Heck, in this native landscape in the Harris Fire, the Harris Fire actually split and went around this whole property here, didn't even burn the mulch. And it doesn't get any starker than this, where the solar array and his house were saved. In this case, about 10 feet of irrigated native plantings and unirrigated chaparral. Finally, you know, you may be left with some erosion control issues, a swell at the back there. Uh, the worst thing you can do is come in and seed with grass. Instead, what you want to do is create debris dams from T posts that have the branches threaded in them. Uh, this was actually seeded aerially about 40 years ago, 35 years ago. It still looks like this today. Wherever the grass came up on Quest to Grade here, there are no, there is no chaparral. It never came back. So it's just, just a disaster, especially ryegrass. Ryegrass is actually the very worst, but any, any of these non-native flashy fields just ruin the ecology in one fell swoop. This is what it should be. It should be left alone to come back on its own if it has any ecology left, you know. This was an Escondido here. Everybody's running out to the desert this year to look at the flowers and we had this incredible show right, right in our neighborhoods. It was amazing, okay? And even the landscapes came back beautifully. But here's an example of a site that was seeded, destroyed in one swoop. Right when it's most vulnerable, it's ash, uh, it's burned, and you bring in uh, non-native weeds that, that actually collapse the native plant community and take over. It should look like this instead. You don't mess with it. And then a year later, and then five years later, and you're back to recovery. And that's the end. Any questions? So many questions. Um, we are over time, though, a little bit. I want to respect your time, among everything else. 
Um, no, don't worry about my time. I'm good. I'm sorry it ran over, but uh, just, and that, that's actually cutting it back. So I'm sorry it, it's long. No, no. Well, we appreciate you being here. And I think the big question is, as we're going to send out resources and people are going to continue talking about this and they have a lot of questions, I want to give them uh, resources. And we're going to send out a follow-up email with a recording of this and with some resources. But I believe you have a couple of books and a website as well. Right. So um, we wrote a couple books. The first one, the California Native Landscape, has a whole chapter on this stuff. And most of this information is actually in there. A lot of these pictures are in there too. And especially if you're new to native plants, that's the book I probably recommend more strongly because it was written as a textbook and goes into a lot of depth and detail into the ecology, the science, the soil science, design theory, everything. You know, it's um, most of the books out there are really great, but they're more like plant encyclopedias, you know. Ours really delves into the background. Uh, also, the Las Palitas website is fantastic. It's uh, laspilitas.com, spelled L-A-S-P-I-L-I, tas.com. Bert Wilson, rest his soul, was my main mentor. Uh, when I got into this, he was also a Cal Fire fireman. So he came out from both ends and he taught me well. And he's got whole sections of this 5,000 page website that are nothing but fire. He did this whole study on leaf burn times relative. And it's just fantastic. So that's a great resource. Um, we're also for the uh, APLD, which is the uh, Association of Professional Landscape Designers. We're actually developing a curriculum. It's mostly going to be aimed at professionals. It'll be a series of webinars uh, on a lot of these topics expanded way out into about a, I don't know, 24 hour curriculum. So they're out there and they're, they're, there's more and more out there. Um, not everybody agrees with our approaches, frankly, but I will tell you we're the only ones that have actually scientifically studied them. And one of the things that you see it's kind of missing from a lot of the fire presentations is fire. I mean, you don't see a lot of these actual burn properties and experience that. So, um, yeah. Well, terrific. So people can see you at the CNPS conference speaking. Oh and yes, I'll be there in October. Um, it'll be in the horticultural and climate change uh, track. And oh, my I, my website has a lot of this too. It's www.calown, C-A-L-O-W-N.com. That's C-A-L-O-W-N.com. Not trying to be self-promotional, but these are your information sources. Yeah, it's good to have resources. Well, thank you so much again, Greg. We will, this is recorded. We're going to go ahead and follow up this with an email to everybody who registered and it will have a link to the recording, a bunch of resources, and then the recording will be available for the people to reference all of these, this great information. Um, so we will be sending that out soon. We're sorry about okay. the background chat issue. Um, sometimes Zoom does what Zoom is gonna do, but... Uh, we appreciate you. Thanks, Greg. Hey, thank you very much. All right. Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night.